How's that uh, volume okay there? Yes? Okay. Uh, would it be a good idea to bring these lights down right here? I noticed that my background is really terribly dark. I apologize for that, but it might help a little if those lights came down. And while we're looking at that, can I just ask, are there any credit unions in the room? So, Sheila, I just want to commit to you to work with you across this next year and, and try to get some more credit unions here. I've, I've been having a ball at this conference. I've learned an awful lot. The networking has been fantastic. And I, uh, as you know, 53 great credit unions in this state, I think, and it would really be uh, nice to get more of them here next year. So, I want to start by reiterating, although the title of this talk is Home Lending and Foreclosure Prevention at Self-Help Federal Credit Union, I no longer work there. <laughs> I, do, I do have the blessing of my former employer to talk a little bit about that experience and that work. Um, and it is an interesting experience, a very interesting organization. Uh, but I did about six, seven months ago now move um, to Montana, uh, and I am now working as the president and CEO of Missoula Federal Credit Union, which a lot of you know, I, I, I sense from the conversations I've been having while I've been here, a great credit union in the southwest corner of the state serving Missoula, Ravali, uh, and Lake Counties. Um, I am also not a housing finance expert. I'm very much a credit union generalist, um, but I, across my years, and especially uh, as I worked at self-help, um, was surrounded by some folks who really are some of the country's leading housing finance experts, and they're also people who are um, extremely mission-oriented, very creative, and very courageous lenders. And I, I think that more than anything, Sheila asked me to come um, and talk today uh, not to deliver housing finance expertise or pretend that I know Montana really well, uh, but to celebrate that, that um, creativity, that mission focus, and, and just talk a little bit about and shed some light uh, uh, on um, what another um, interesting community development lender is doing in another part of the world, another part of the country. By all skip. Um, as I proceed, I'm going to talk sometimes generally, especially in the beginning, uh, about self-help. Um, but I should stress that self-help is actually um, a family of organizations. Uh, there are multiple entities within in the self-help family. I have five pictured here. They're kind of the, the core of the legal entities that make up the organization. There are two credit unions on um, either outside of the of the. Um, slide you're looking at. One is a state charter in North Carolina, Self-Help Credit Union, and the other, um, the one that I'm most familiar with, is a federal charter, Self-Help Federal Credit Union, which is on the far right-hand side. At the center of the organization, there's a 501c3 called the Center for Community Self-Help, the original organization. Um, there's a venture capital fund called um, uh, I'm forgetting the Self-Help Venture Capital Fund. Uh, and it is, it is an entity that does far more complex lending than what can the credit unions. Um, charter schools, a lot of not-for-profit uh, facilities, development lending, um, and that, that type of thing. And then there is, uh, in addition, um, an organization called the Center for Responsible Lending, which, which is located in North Carolina, um, Washington, D.C. primarily, and also California, which is all about research, policy, advocacy uh, work, trying to ensure that the policy framework for the deliver of delivery of financial services to, to low-income households across the country is done in a, a fair and progressive way. The um, organization as a whole shares a common mission, um, which is to um, create and protect ownership and economic opportunity for all people. You'll find, as I push along here, that the, the focus is very, very much on low-income, minority, underserved people and communities. Uh, the mission statement is a little broader than that. So I want to I wanna, um, start. And, and I should say also that the, the, the start of my talk here will focus on self-help as a whole. Later on, I'm going to get real specific um, on self-help federal credit union and what it was doing across the last five years or so in the areas of home lending and foreclosure prevention. But I think it helps to set the stage just a little bit uh, by talking about the origins of self-help as a whole. Sorry, I'm not going to go to that slide yet. Um, my boss um, at self-help um, the CEO of the organization, a guy named Martin Eeks. Martin and his wife, uh, Bonnie, started self-help together in 1980. And their goal um, at the time was simply to build a not-for-profit organization that helped to connect uh, minority entrepreneurs to business finance. Simple as that. 
At that time, uh, the net wealth of the average white American household was about 11 times greater than the net wealth of the average African American family. And their, their, their thinking uh, was that by mobilizing finance toward minority entrepreneurs in North Carolina, they could affect jobs, income, and ultimately household wealth. They very quickly um, bumped into a, a new finding, new for themselves, but something that many of you all probably already recognize and some um, back then recognized as well, and that was that the community of people they were working with were at a distinct disadvantage in the first place because they couldn't tap home equity um, for flexible, low-cost finance um, to grow their businesses. <laughs> Um, home loans, um, which were the, sort of the first step to home ownership, which could then lead to the equity, that could then lead to the more flexible and low-cost financing, were not available to the people that they were working with. So their shift, uh, their focus shifted dramatically. In a sense, they launched the credit union, self-help credit union in North Carolina in 1982, and they began to build a uh, core competency in home lending. I want to now just fast forward um, to sort of tell the, paint the picture of impact from then till now and some, at some, with some very high level um, numbers. So since, since founding through to today, uh, the organization as a whole has mobilized approximately $7 billion in financing, all through loans, um, to about 85,000 individuals, families, and organizations. 82% of those have been to low-income borrowers, and, and self-help defines low-income as 80% of area median income. 47%, almost half of the loans have gone to people of color. In the early days, the focus was in the African-American community in North Carolina. Um, in, in later days, more recently with expansion, there's been a lot of focus on growing Latino communities as well. 41% of borrowers have been women-headed households or women-headed businesses. Direct home lending, um, accounts for about 430 million of that total financing, um, affecting some 5,500 individuals. Secondary market home lending um, is the far larger part of the total impact. F almost 5 billion in total loans financed um, and about 52,000 homeowners affected. So um, clearly secondary market um, has been a big part of what self-help has done over the years. It's a, a very interesting part of the story, and so I'm going to just um, spend a couple minutes um, telling that story. I'm going to jump to the next slide. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail um, here on the, on the secondary market uh, evolution of self-help's work in the secondary market financing of um, home loans to low-income, limited-asset families. But this is a fantastic small book that, if you're interested, uh, really does dig into that story. And it actually, um, it actually um, is a research-oriented um, book in which about 42,000 of those borrowers were tracked from origination through the financial crisis to try and tell a story about how did these folks weather, um, how did, not only how did, did they get access to loans, but how did they weather the downturn and how are they doing today? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very um, good read and I think has some really interesting um, policy um, and lending uh, lessons impact in it. So the Self-Help Credit Union began its home lending shortly after um, it started early 80s, and, and the organization and its, its staff started to <laughs> cut their teeth, learn the trade, uh, do a little bit better. By the mid-late 80s, um, the credit union was actually starting to buy small pools of um, Community Reinvestment Act home loans from some North Carolina banks. Some of these banks would become some of the largest banks in the country. Um, they were on mergers and acquisition pathways. They were very, very keen to maximize CRA credits, and um, Martin uh, and the organization were very, very keen to learn more um, and develop more skills in this, this area of home lending. In 1994, um, the credit union made a fairly audacious move. It was just a $55 million credit union that bought a $20 million CRA home loan portfolio from a North Carolina bank. That caught the attention of regulators. <laughs> it caught the attention of the philanthropic community, and it also caught the attention of Fannie Mae. And, and so probably a lot of you in this room know this, this part of the story even better. But, but at the time, there really wasn't a secondary market outlet for these loans. So banks would be making a handful of good CRA home loans, um, but there was no outlet, they, they, and that was generally because of lower credit scores, limited assets, no, no, no mortgage insurance, or, 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 or other factors, often non-traditional forms of employment. Um, the, um, 
the organization got some attention for actually um, doing quite a good job at sourcing, uh, pricing, onboarding, servicing, and managing these loan, loan portfolios. And it made a second very audacious move in 1998, which was to go to Ford Foundation and say, give us $50 million um, and we will work with Fannie Mae and CRA lenders around the country um, in order to prove, one, that we can create a secondary market, an efficient secondary market for these home loans, and two, that these are good loans, that the borrowers um, will repay these loans, they will be good for the lending institutions um, and the system as a whole. So, incredibly, um, Ford Foundation said, yes, okay, we'll do it. Um, the 50 million, Fannie Mae then agreed to, to um, finance greater than $2 billion um, across a, I think it was a 10 year period at the time, um, and the $50 million was not used as financing, but it was used as a credit enhancement. Um, Self-help would buy the loans from banks, primarily a few credit unions, but mostly banks, um, sell them on to Fannie Mae, but hold the credit risk and use that $50 million as a reserve. Um, so across uh, the period roughly 98 through 2008, um, roughly 42,000 loans um, were made in this, in this, in this manner. Um, again, this, story, this book tells the story quite well. I would really encourage you to take a look at it if you have some time and, and more interest. Um, on the whole, um, it was a very um, exciting and I think successful demonstration. Switching gears now <clears throat> to self-help federal credit union which would benefit very, very much from that demonstration and be able to grow um, quite rapidly um, on that core competency of home lending to low income, limited asset households. Self-Help Federal Credit Union, uh, credit union that I worked for during my five years at Self-Help, was founded uh, in 2008. So it's the youngest, youngest member of the family of um, self-help organizations. The goal at the time was simply to build a really good, strong retail community development credit union that had branches all up and down the state of California. Um, largest population for a state in this country, largest state economy. Um, there were obvious reasons um, that the organization wanted to get there. Um, it's also a state in which there is a disproportionate number of fringe sector financial services providers, um, payday lenders, check cashing outlets, pawn shops, etc. Uh, and so uh, my CEO at the time was very, very keen to get to California, grow an organization to scale and have some impact in California. This was 2008. The downturn um, really sunk in, and it became clear very, very quickly um, that growing to scale in California would also mean, and doing so quickly, would also mean building a, a mergers and acquisitions platform. And, and that, that is what we did. And after just five years of growth um, from, from zero in 2008 and a new charter, by the time I left at the end of 2013, the credit union was $600 million in assets. Um, with three distinct retail brands within it, um, serving um, a total of about 70,000 people. Um, it was in California, and it had also grown to Chicago. And I'm going to just now touch briefly on um, each of those retail brands, because they're, they're interesting and different each. So the first and kind of most traditional um, of the retail brands is called Community Trust, a division of self-help federal credit union. Um, that um, has grown through a combination of seven, uh, uh, seven uh, credit union mergers in California, in the Bay Area, uh, and in the Central Valley. Um, it it is now consists of 11 branches, um, with most of the members in the Central Valley, um, and 40,000 um, total members. The second uh, retail brand um, is a brand called uh, Prospera, a division of Self-Help Federal Credit Union. This is a, a little more um, interesting and innovative of a, of a project. Um, in 2009, I think it was, um, we decided to um, launch a pilot, which um, had us opening up um, a small storefront in East San Jose, um, a distressed neighborhood, mostly Latina, with a very, very um, high proportion of, of payday lenders and check cashers and um, very few uh, banks or credit unions doing business. And the simple um, theory was really that we, we, we believed we, we could, by building a storefront that looked and felt like a check cashing store and did everything that check cashers did except for payday lending and buying gold, um, and then having credit union services on the back end that would be offered up to people 
quietly, uh, discreetly, slowly over time as they began to trust the institution and giving folks a discount on check cashing once they got on a very modest savings path, could we reach more unbanked people? T time will tell. This is a project that hasn't been proved out yet, I think, um, but um, it has been pushed to scale. A uh, um, couple years after the launch in 2009, I think it was 2011, bought um, a small chain, five stores of a, of a, of a small-time check casher down in the San Gabriel Valley of Los Angeles and are now testing this out with, with you know, at some scale, about 20,000 people using those six branches um, and um, we're experimenting to see if this might be a way to reach more un unbanked people. You have to forgive me, I'm going to slip into the we are doing this every now and then when in <laughs> fact I'm, I'm no longer there. Um, but that's a, that's a fascinating story unto itself and one that I would also encourage you to take a look at. This is fascinating too. Um, uh, mid 2000, uh, it was two, early 2012 I believe, um, the, the uh, credit union um, came into an opportunity to actually um, buy um, and stitch back together a failed SNL in the Chicago market on the south side of Chicago that FDIC had, um, uh, had taken over and broken in half, selling the loans and well, selling the deposits and branches in one direction and then auctioning off the loans. Um, Another very fascinating and interesting story we can't go into great detail on, but somehow uh, my CEO managed to win the loans at auction and persuade the Chicago bank to flip the branches and deposits back to self help to stitch the sucker back together again um, and try then to pull this banking operation into credit union operation. Um, also heavily Latino um, neighborhood uh, with a lot of distressed mortgage and interesting opportunities for home lending going forward. So that's three branches, a total of 10,000 members. And that's just to give you a bit of a perspective on what, what constitutes self-help federal today. Um, so anybody in the room who has done any mergers or acquisitions um, growth knows that um, nine combinations in five years is a lot. And when you layer in banks into credit unions, check casher acquisitions, it gets, um, it gets really dicey, I think. There's a lot to be learned in all of that, a um, lot of interesting stories to tell from analysis and due diligence to pricing to the cultural integration to how to handle core system conversions, how to, how to bring people on board and do product and service conversions. I want to spend the rest of the time, though, focused on um, a couple of fundamental economic questions, which I think will be more interesting to this group. Um, one being, how do you manage loan losses? Um, credit union combinations and any mergers almost in the last five years or so um, typically don't involve two strong partners. There's typically one distressed partner um, that is bringing over a loan portfolio that is not healthy. Um, and so managing through loan losses at or better than um, expectation is a very important part of the project. For Self-Help Federal, um, a large part of that distressed loan portfolio was mortgage, and the strategy that we employed was to get very, very aggressive on modifications and see if um, we could manage through um, by keeping people in their homes. And then secondly, um, economic engine. Um, it's difficult to pause, to think about new market niches, to um, develop new product or service while all of this other integration activity is going on. So to the extent that you can have a core product um, that can serve as the economic engine, uh, that can run through all of this activity, uh, the financial institution will be better off. For Self-Help Federal, this meant building on the history, the 30-year history of home lending to low-income, limited asset households, and, and, and trying to really ramp that up in a more significant way. So um, I'm going to start with the loan losses. Um, <clears throat> the portfolio uh, that was inherited um, through mergers and acquisitions growth um, was about 2,500 loans uh, in that five-year period. There's more activity going on today, but I'm sort of cutting off at 2013. Um, total, total, total mortgages in that um, 2,500 loans were about, 200, about 250 million. Some of these portfolios um, were as distressed as 30% 60-day delinquency. So, so 30% of the, of the loans um, were 60 days or greater um, at, at the moment of the combination. Averaging across that whole, and, uh, that whole $250 million in loans, um, LTVs ranged from 125% to 150%. So Chicago market, Central Valley market in particular, 
really uh, very distressed in terms of loan to value. Um, housing values really plummeted in those markets. Um, there are you know discrete cases of far more than the 150. This is an average. It was pretty remarkable. Um, and the Chicago market was um, probably not least because of the distress and the, that the SNL went through and the time that it took for FDIC to take it, split it, auction it, bring it back to another financial institution. The delinquency in that portfolio was extraordinary. That, that was up in the 30% in the numbers on 60 days plus. So what did we do? Um, as I said, um, you know, it, the, 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 the game plan was to um, get really aggressive, see how far we could push loan modifications, and um, work very, very hard to keep families in their homes. Um, we developed a, a team, a pure outreach team, that was not an analytical team, but was almost more of a marketing team, that was working phones, that was out in the street, that was working with churches, working with local labor organizations, and really getting the word out that the credit union um, was there um, to talk um, about how to get people that were already in home loans into better home loans. The portfolios were full of all kinds of different things. There were interest-only loans, there were balloon loans, uh, there were various types of arms, and um, our focus was to really zoom in to a, a relatively simple um, product and to, and this is one of the points on this page, um, give that outreach team um, the power to go out and say to people, we will reduce your monthly payment by at least 20%. So the, the, the message wasn't, come talk to us, we'll talk about modification. It was, we will reduce that payment by 20%. Come talk to us. Let's figure out what, what, we can, what else we can do, if anything. The um, back-end team um, was not doing outreach. They were um, based in North Carolina, where the, the, the mothership is. Um, and they were, uh, it's a very sophisticated team, a lot of experience having worked in the secondary market um, um, in the home lending I described for so many years. Um, and they were, they were really asked to just be the analytical and decisioning team. So we sort of took a decision to split these two groups of people and get them purely focused on those two different types of tasks. Most of the modifications that took place were took place by way of interest rate concessions and term resets with a target um, debt to income ratio of 31% housing. In about a third of cases, um, the credit union ended up going far deeper, um, but well below 31% in order to get people to the table and get, get these deals closed. And so in a sense, um, you know, one could argue, that, and I've been, at the, been at these take conversa in these conversations before where it's sort of there's a, a drive to go even lower than that to keep, get the deal done, keep the person in their house, and the conversation turns to the other creditors. But what about those credit cards? What about that auto loan? In a sense, self-help said, you know, we're not going to worry about that. If we need to take a hit, in a sense, in order to subsidize some of those other lenders, we're going to do it. We think it makes sense. And you know, time will tell whether it will make sense or not. But it, uh, it, it was an interesting and strong, I think, philosophical commitment. We did a limited number of shared appreciation agreements, too, where um, people were deeply delinquent uh, as of a certain date, um, deeply underwater, nothing else would work. Um, and the story was something along the lines of write the loan down to about 110% LTV, park the remainder in a non-amortizing, non-interest accruing second, um, forgive it after five or seven years of home occupancy and, 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 and loan payments, and then at the point of sale after that five or seven year period, ask borrower to give back 25 or 50 percent of appreciation when in fact they do sell. Smaller number of those, but it was another tool in the toolkit. Um, and again, time, time will tell um, whether that proves to have been a, a, a good strategic move or not. Short term, um, it, it, things, are, things are looking pretty good. Um, you know, measuring by way of 30-day delinquency is just one way to slice this. I want to stress again over and over that, you know, that the truth will come five, ten years down the road as to whether these were good um, home modification foreclosure recovery, um, foreclosure prevention strategies or not. But as you can see in this graph, the kind of the delinquency ramps up 
pretty steeply as the credit union is growing through mergers and, and acquisitions. And then as the modification activity starts to kick in in 2011, more like 12 and 13, um, it's come down pretty dramatically. To me, these are really impressive numbers. Um, and I think they at least um, point, point away start to answer the question, will people come, will they modify? They will. Um, whether or not they can stay in those homes long term will, remains to be seen, I think. So um, now shifting gears just a little bit to um, the home lending um, itself. As I said, you know, 30 years of experience um, doing home lending to lower income, limited asshole, asset households gave Self-help federal credit union as a startup doing a lot of mergers and acquisitions, confidence to really um, go for it and, and push this product as the core to the economic engine. But I now want to pause and just talk for a moment about what, what what are we talking about in these home loans? What are the what are the product features um, in these home loans that I've described as low-income limited asset or or um, otherwise community reinvestment act loans? And for self-help federal, um, this meant 97% um, LTV. Um, credit scores um, driving down as low as 580. Um, target DTI, 35% housing, 45% total. Um, very strict review of collateral. Um, often talked to um, loan officers and realtors who are extremely frustrated by the organization's detail on house, home inspections and the quality of the collateral, but it was a, a commitment that um, uh, the, the, the management in the organization had made to borrowers, really, even though it was quite frustrating to them sometimes, um, to make sure that folks with limited, limited resources weren't being put into homes that they could afford, but not afford to repair should something happen um, not, not long after closing the loan. Borrower funds, 3 to 5 percent. That 3 was typical. 5 percent was used um, um, for ITIN borrowers. Um, there was a, if anybody, I'm not sure if folks in the crowd are familiar with ITIN borrowing, but it is um, an alternative to the Social Security number. A person who's not a full citizen but is here working and paying taxes will tend to have an ITIN. Um, in the markets we were working in, of course, the south side of Chicago, Central Valley of California, there were quite a few ITIN borrowers, and there, uh, there's not a lot of other options out there for ITIN borrowers. So that was a, that was a, a, a piece of the puzzle, and then one to two months of reserves um, in, in, in um, mortgage funds. So these were um, balance sheet home loans. Um, the credit union is holding these loans on its books. It manages its rate risk through swaps. Uh, which is um, not easy for most credit unions to do. It happens to be a relatively larger organization with a lot of sophisticated back end. Um, you know, there's, there's real credit risk in these loans, um, but what I think one of the main lessons that um, self-help has learned over time uh, and has come to really believe is that the product design itself uh, will either amplify or mitigate that risk. Um, and there's a strong belief that the mitigation is strong enough to go out, do it, hold on balance sheet. The loans are 30-year fixed rate loans. As I said earlier, the focus is on long-term affordability. There's never any ground given on, on affordability. Um, and there's a very careful look at the collateral all the time. There's really um, very little ground given on uh, weak, weaker collateral, which I should say, and I've heard some conversations around quality of REOs um, in Montana, it was often frustrating for some of our borrowers as well um, and, and other organizations we were working with in that a lot of the housing stock that was available and affordable was bank-owned, um, but we, we found it quite difficult um, um, to, to underwrite the, that collateral, it tended to be um, less high quality. So um, as of uh, today, uh, the credit union's on track to originate about 50 million um, of this type of home loans um, in a year, which for a $600 million credit union is not all that impressive. I would argue, however, given the type of lending and given the, the newness um, of the organization and all of the combinations and integration it's been doing over the years, it's, it's, it's pretty darn good. Um, my last slide is just a kind of high-level concluding thoughts. Um, you know, this is this is none of this is to say um, he, he, we're all confronted with 
different kinds of problems in and around the state of, of Montana that, that this is a model that can work here. I, I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think there's a lot of interesting lessons to be learned here. Um, and it is one very, very exciting um, and, and, and um, interesting um, growth path that another community development lender has pursued in, a, in another part of the country. Probably is the fastest growing credit union startup in history in this country. I don't know that for a fact, but I don't know how to do that research either. Um, and, I, and I, you know, it's just, it's been very, very impressive. I think, I think the story does show that home lending to this particular um, population of borrower can be a viable engine um, for a mid-sized, even smaller credit union. The interest rate risk management is not easy, um, and that's a, probably a difficult hurdle for some smaller shops. Um, and I think that the other lesson really around that aggressive um, outreach um, and home loan modification strategy it says people will come to the table, but again, time will tell whether that proves to be a good strategy and whether people really um, stay in those homes. So um, that's it um, for my presentation. Um, thanks very, very much for having me here. I'm really, really am. I mean, I think it's fashionable to say um, yeah, I'm humbled to be here, but being as new as I am to the state and um, not being a high housing finance expert, I really am humbled to be here. I've had a great time at the conference, and uh, I look forward to working with all of you many, many years to come. Thanks. All right. Now, are there any questions for, um, for Jack? I, I want to say, Jack, why did you come to Montana? What were you thinking? <laughs> so, um, I, I'm just trying to think of a joking answer. I don't have one. Um, the uh, the uh, I grew up in Vermont, and um, while working at Self Help was fantastic, and living in Berkeley, California, which is kind of a suburban paradise, was nice. We we wanted to get back to the country, honestly. And um, Montana has always been high on the list of places to come and live. And um, I've actually just been blown away by how what a wonderful spot Missoula is to live, and how many good people I've already met around the state. So it's a job opportunity an opportunity to come live in a great part of the world. Other questions? Okay. Okay, let's, let's answer yeah. questions first, okay? All right, got a question over here. Okay. Okay. Can um, residents from Montana access these services in other states? Do you have to be a resident of the state to use this? So I, I think the question then is um, to, to get the services that self-help as an organization is offering, can, can, do, do you have to live um, um, in one of the states that it's operating? I mean, you need to be a member of one of the credit unions, um, self-help credit union or self-help federal, to access the things that I was talking about. Um, um, and that would be very difficult for the state charter, not impossible for the federal charter, except that your closest branch is in, you know, Little Village, Chicago. So there is an online, you know, there's a, web, there's a website and a, an online banking platform through which one could join the credit union, um, but you would not have branch infrastructure. But would, like, a loan like that be available, say, they join the credit union online and then do like Skype sessions or something for someone to be able to access? In truth, in truth, I think, um, I, I don't think the credit union is yet set up to do home lending in a, in, in a state like Montana. It's, it's got some expertise in North Carolina, in, in California now, in Chicago, but direct home lending probably limited to those places for the time being. Thank you. Any questions, other questions for Jack? All right, well, we want to thank Jack for a couple things. One, moving to Montana and bringing this kind of wisdom to the credit union movement in Montana. Many of us deal with uh, credit unions every day. Fabulous, fabulous partners. Um, this can really be a leap um, to, to uh, even greater, I think, uh, services available through the credit union network. Um, secondly, we want to thank you for driving all the way from Missoula. And I know many of you did that too, but that's no easy drive. So thank you for doing that. And um, thank you for sharing with us all of the pieces that you did today. This is an amazing story. Yeah. Um, so we want to present you with this little gift. Thank you very much. Thank you.